So I think, shall I leave? We can do the three, two, one thing. It's already done. Okay, perfect. So we're already recording. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Uh, All right. So before I screen share, because I won't be able to see you guys while I'm doing this, which is going to be interesting. So I'm, I'm basically presenting to my computer. I just want to get an idea. Uh, how many people use Git right now already for content? Okay, cool. So I just wanted to kind of gauge the audience just a bit. So I want to thank Christoph and the Redox London group for having me. This is really exciting to get to do remotely. Um, people were like, how are you going to London by tomorrow? So I don't know, <laughs> via Skype or, or some other video conferencing. So thank you guys and thank you Mozilla for hosting. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And then if you guys can just let me know when you see my slides. Yep, yep, yep. yep awesome. Okay. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our developer docs experience that we just rebuilt here at Atlassian and some of the thinking that went into this and why we did made some of the decisions that we did. First, I want to introduce myself. I'm Becky Todd. I'm a senior developer or sorry, senior technical writer on the developer relations team here at Atlassian. I live in Austin, Texas and have been working with and managing enterprise software documentation for most of my career. Um, and a lot of that time has been using various forms of source control, different repo management tools, and that kind of thing. And I do work at Atlassian, so you'll probably see some dog fooding information in this presentation, but I've tried to keep everything really tool agnostic so you can take some things away regardless of what tools you're using. So let's go ahead and get started. So before I go too much farther, I want to say that I got off to a really rocky start when I first used Git. And I have since grown to love it, and I now teach people at uh, different companies that I've worked at how to use it and how to manage content with Git, because that's kind of why we're here today. And so I've used Stash back before it was Bitbucket Server. I use GitHub. I use Bitbucket. I haven't used GitLab, but it looks like a really great tool. So it, again, all the things I'm going to talk about today, you could probably make happen with, with any tool. So I'm going to tell the story kind of in reverse. So last November, we launched our new developer experience. We completely revamped everything on the site, um, starting with one of our products. And so this is what it looks like. I've, I've get shown here a sample page. It's sort of representative of all the things we did with the new site, but there are a few things that I want to highlight. First, we completely overhauled how we were doing the information architecture, both on the front end and on the back end, um, because we needed to make things a little bit easier for people to use. We did a lot of little usability uh, upgrades, like syntax highlighting, better mini TOCs, uh, dates of publication of different articles. And we also added the ability for our community to actually contribute to our docs. So we have this new improve this page functionality. And when you click this, which I'll show you later, you can actually go right into our content on Bitbucket and be able to, to do an update and make a pull request, which is really, really cool. And, but the thing that I was the most excited about as a content nerd was the fact that we actually integrated our auto-generated content with the handcrafted content like tutorials and how-to guides um, so that they could be displayed together in the static site. So we actually broke down a bunch of the silos that we had to be able to present all this content together at the same time. So that's great. We have a nice looking documentation site. It looks fancy. It's got cool features. So how is this related to versioning content? So I want to take a step back and talk about some of the reasons why we redesigned our content and workflow. So I joined the company about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago now, and I was brought in to take a look at some of the challenges our developer docs were facing. And so I started by doing some research. I went to the different teams here and started asking really simple questions. Who writes your content? Do you update it every release? Who uses this? What kind of content do you have? How are you publishing content? Some really, really basic things to kind of gather information about what we have. Um, are your API docs in Swagger or are they in another technology? Things like that. I also decided to reach out to our users and get some feedback from them to see how things were and, and sort of where we stood. And I got a lot of feedback that looked a lot like this. So this is an actual quote. I've added the emphasis. But basically, we got a lot of feedback saying your stuff's out of date. 
make a current version of everything. Uh, other things that we found out were, you know, content's hard to find. We can't search through your content very well. Um, so this sort of seemed like a giant red flag because this was mostly the feedback that we got. So we did some additional research into this area. We started doing some user testing to see, okay, well, we are getting all this feedback. Can we actually set some sort of measurement out where we could say, okay, here are our goals for our content and here are the things that we can actually test for. So if we're gonna redesign this experience, um, how is that gonna be measurable? And I don't know if you guys have ever tried to measure docs. Um, it's really, really challenging. So we set out with some simple goals, like it can take less than 30 minutes to complete a tutorial. Everyone can finish the tutorial. And we failed. Um, I'm not gonna go into super big detail about what this was, but it was basically a getting started tutorial that was presenting the users with a ton of challenges. Um, I didn't put this in here, but I also spent some time talking with the actual people who are authoring content and found out that they were finding it very difficult because we had a lot of different processes. So we kind of got a few key takeaways from all of this information. We need to provide um, up-to-date content, which none of these things should come to, as a surprise to you if you've ever worked in, in content. Um, we need it to be an easy process for writers to write because maybe we have out-of-date content because it's hard. And we also just, generally speaking, need to improve the, the way that people can use the site. So we had um, all this really great information, and I work with a really awesome team of people. So we set some guiding principles um, and started looking at the design phase. And we also decided, I can't believe I didn't put this in my notes, that we, we were going to just start over. Like, maybe it was better just to start over from scratch and go from there. So we decided we're going to set out, we're going to solve all these problems. We're going to make search and navigation easy. Everything's going to be up to date. We're going to get rid of our out of date junk content. We're going to refresh the whole design of the site, keeping users in mind, and then make everything easy for everyone, which sounds really great, but those are some huge goals. So in the back of my mind, I was thinking, how the bleep will I get this done? Like, how is this going to happen? So. As I said, I'm surrounded by a really great team of people, so we got to work. And we spent some time focusing on a few different areas. The first was the collaboration aspect of this. So we have a lot of developers who could potentially be writing content. How does that look? How, how can we get everyone working in a similar system so that we can have all the content in a single place? Uh, we started thinking about the usability of the site. So if we put all of our content to these static docs, how do we make it easy to search? How do we structure this so that it's both easy to collaborate and easy to, and easy to use? How do we keep everything up to date? Um, and then we also had to tackle the, the topic of re repo management. So how are we gonna branch things? How many repos do we need? This was actually a really hotly debated topic among the um, team for a while on, you know, how do we do this? What's easier? Do we, do we use sub modules? Do we do this other strategy? Do we need one repo? Do we not? Um, so that was actually all really great and interesting. Um, and we arrived at this idea that we're going to treat our content as code. And so write the docs. I know that this audience is really, really super aware of this, but this is a concept that isn't familiar within the industry. I don't think as you know, it rolls off the tip of your tongue. So we started thinking about um, keeping everything in the, in the developer's workflow. So we were looking at releases. We have a lot of teams here at Atlassian. So how often are they publishing their content? Do we version everything or do we version some things? And because we have both cloud and, and server products, we do have versions that are different, um, even within some of our, our main products. We were also looking at images. So um, but here and at, at another company I worked at in the past, uh, we stored images in a Git repo. And if you've ever done that before, you know that that can be kind of a challenge because images can be replaced frequently and they can bloat your repo. Um, or you may have to go in and do a, a bunch of work to get rid of them because once they're in, there, in Git, they're kind of there forever. Um, when I used to use Subversion, it wasn't quite the same way. And then the other thing to, to think about when, when approaching this is are you versioning things that are big, like zip files, videos, other types of large files? Um, and where do you want to store those? So it may be a no-brainer to put your videos on Vimeo, but maybe 
you know, if you work at some other companies, you don't host videos out in the public or you need to make these things available offline. So thinking about how you would actually store those things um, either in the single doc repo or in a separate doc repo are all really great. So we settled on keeping everything as simple as possible. We picked a really, really con uh, simple contribution workflow. Um, and this is sort of an illustrated example. Example, you guys are all familiar with Git, but basically we take a contribution from a developer or a writer, whoever, whoever it is, uh, we have a couple people approve the pull request as a requirement, and then we merge it. And in our case, we actually have it set up to where we can publish things right away. Um, I've seen this done a bunch of different ways, but you can batch publish things or not. It all kind of depends on the back end. And I would love to do a tool talk. Um, on how all of this happened with the technology behind it. Um, I tried to stay away from that a little bit in this, in this talk, uh, talk. So then once we got past the design phase and had all of this great stuff, we decided that we needed to figure out what was the best approach to building and getting this adopted. So we chose uh, Jira Cloud to be our first adopter of this. And so they were kind of our early adopter proof of con uh, concept user. And so they came along for the ride as we were building this. And we worked really closely with them to get feedback about using this system so that we would be able to understand if it was working well or if we were going to hit any unexpected roadblocks. And we did. Um, so the other thing that we, that's important to do during this stage is, as soon as possible is actually to think about how you're going to onboard everybody. Uh, Git, I know, is, comes with a giant learning curve. Um, I was a tech writer first, and I've dabbled in, a little bit in more developer-themed uh, concepts, but it, it's a huge learning curve. Are you going to have marketers working in it, and how are you going to support that? And then finally, we also had to work out how we're going to actually uh, accept community contributions. So one of the biggest... Um, how do I want to say this? One of the best things that we did was started to assemble a content toolkit. We have a writing toolkit already at Atlassian, and that covers our voice and tone, how to, form, how to format procedures, uh, other kinds of content, how to build tutorials, all of those different kind of basic writing guidelines. And so what we did here was we built a content toolkit for the developer site. So it includes the instructions on how to get the site set up, um, where to access the style guides you need, all of, all of those basics. We also um, documented the workflow. So how do you, who writes, who reviews, how do you accept a pull request from somebody outside the company because we do have to have them sign a contributor uh, agreement. And so all of those things are, are in there. And, and finally, and this is, shouldn't be overlooked, how do you actually publish content? Um, particularly when you have a lot of teams that are self-helping, you need to make sure that it's clear when they are or are not sending docs out into the wild. So, if you merge something, does it go out immediately or do you have the ability to see it on a staging server first and how that process works? So I originally had a really awesome animation in the slide deck and I would love to show it, but basically if you are on our developer site or now you can click that improve this page button and this is what it looks like for the community contributor. And so I've added the words demo, which I'm gonna make a commit here. Um, What's really neat about this is that it drops you in Bitbucket and you can actually edit the content right on the, on the Bitbucket site from the UI. Of course, if you wanted, you could probably fork the repo, download it and, and do all of that stuff as well. But this allows you to have the least amount of friction possible to just make a change real quick. And we've already saw, uh, started to see some of these changes rolling in even though we've only gotten a small portion of our content on the site. And something else I should add there is that we do all of the Git work for them in the background if you choose that path. So you don't have to struggle with, with anything. So I want to return um, to the user testing things because what's really important when you do anything like this is to think about how you're going to measure it. And so as you recall, we had a lot of problems when we set out with this one metric of how are we going to onboard people. And so we repeated the same user testing and got, we achieved our goals, which is great, but then we learned new things. So we learned that it's um, actually making people feel good. Whereas before, I don't think, I didn't conduct user testing, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that the people weren't happy because they probably failed while someone was watching them. So that's really great. And we also started to, 
to observe something that we had assumed early on, which is that people use responsive mode uh, for documentation in ways that you don't expect. Um, in fact, when we did an early beta of the site, we actually got the first comment that I got was mobile version, please, um, immediately. And so we started observing that people will take advantage of the uh, vertical tablet size and set it right next to their IDE or command line or, or whatever it is that they're doing. And so this is actually a really huge thing. Um, so it's you never know what you're going to learn from your users, I guess, is the, the main point I want to make. So finally, I also want to talk about the side of adoption that's a little bit more challenging, which is getting everybody in the company to actually use this content system. And so I want to call out the idea of content champions. And these people can be anyone on any team. Uh, tech writers are, tend to be content champions, but you can also have developers and support engineers and QA people or product managers. Anyone can be one. And all people who are content champions have one thing in common. Uh, they value good documentation just as much as tech writers do. And so they will also help play a key role in adoption because these are the people at the end of the day who will need to be accountable for the content. It's great to get all the content on the new system, but some of the problems that we need to solve have to come from within and we have to start making our content better. So I have really been doing a lot of internal evangelism to get our content champions in a really good place. So that's all I had. Um, I just want to challenge you to think, how can you support your content champions, especially when you're going down this road? Um, and I want to say thank you to everybody. And please ask me questions. Questions? Christiana? You said you, <coughs> sorry, you said you wanted to stay away from the, um, the technical side, but I'd love to know, like, what tool are you using to actually publish? And especially also the, the question you raised, which is to use submodules or not, what was the decision there? Well, we're actually, so when we initially, okay, I'll answer them in the order you asked. So the tools that we're using um, include Hugo, which is a static site generator that we chose to use because it's got some really awesome features. It's written in Go, so it's very shiny right now. Um, and it allows us to use short codes, which allows us to reuse content in ways that it's sort of a makeshift content management system would. And we're using Bitbucket and Bamboo to build and uh, store, build, and deploy. And then we've got some other technology mixed in. I wrote a blog on developer.lassian.com in November that highlights all the technology, um, if you want to look that up. The other question, uh, sorry, say it again. It was. Um, how you dealt with the submodules kind of question. Ah, okay. Like, is all so the code, all the content? <laughs> we initially decided to keep everything in a single repo because we wanted to build fast and fail fast. So that was how we started. Um, the And I was the product owner during that time. Since then, we have a new product owner who's focusing on that. They are using a multiple repo structure because we're adopting this um, deployment both for internal content and for external content. So they've since broken that up. And I'd have to get back to you on whether or not they use submodules or not, because I don't know the answer. Other questions? Yep. Um, you talked a bit about uh, supporting your uh, content champions. So I'm just interested to in a bit more detail about how you how you went about doing that. So we're just getting started here at Atlassian with this process. I, at another company that I worked at, I spent a lot of time coaching and mentoring and being an internal, basically, champion or cheerleader um, to, to make sure everyone was aware of what they could and couldn't do with the content. And through that process, a lot of people started to internalize the idea that docs should really be thought about earlier in the process. And in one case, our support team actually really, really jumped on the bandwagon and started using our Git uh, repo content si uh, system. At that company, we had multiple repos, and I think they were using submodules. Um, so they developed their own knowledge base. They developed internal trainings, because I didn't have time to do that, and they started training the company. And so this was sort of this internal reward system, and it, they saw the benefit of the content because they were having better luck with fewer support calls and things like that. Um, so 
anything that you can do, it, a lot of legwork, I guess, is the short version of that, but yeah. It certainly was you getting people to write in Markdown, or are they using ASCII doc, or um, how are they writing the content? Sure. We're using Markdown. Um, in this case, I believe we've got uh, Black Friday as the translator, so we're using GitHub flavored Markdown, um, which is great because it's sort of become a kind of base standard. Uh, for simple documentation, although ASCII doc was something that we considered as well because that's got some interesting upsides to more complex content. Yep. Uh, so I've had the experience a couple of times with different clients that the client has uh, bought Confluence and have become very committed to Confluence and have been really resistant to the idea of having any content that is not in Confluence. Um, so I'd be interested to know if you encountered any resistance to not using your own product um, and <laughs> how, how you would advise me to overcome that kind of thinking. Um, so that's an interesting question. Uh, we actually are still using a lot of our products. We're just using different products to meet the needs of the users that we had. In our case, we had a lot of people whose content was already written down or side by side with the code. And so we were integrating a lot of basically um, simple content together. So that was part of the reason why we went down this road. Um, so it's not that we're not using Confluence. We use that every day in, inside on our team and, and that kind of thing. But we we're publishing with a different tool set. Thank you. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that there was a way for some contributors to, to submit stuff that wasn't kind of where they got to kind of ignore the fact that it was Git. Um, how did that work with the people who were using Git uh, and, and were aware of that process? Sure. So the I think you're talking about the improve this page button where you can click right. that and you can just get dumped into this online editor. So how that works is in the background, we actually fork for you. So we deep link to the page that the content is on and you're able to actually just edit there. So if you're less comfortable with the Git workflow, it's a really great way to kind of get you get you going. Um, so there's a lot of Bitbucket features that we use kind of behind the scenes to, to make that happen. Thank you. We've got a question. Um, something that I, I'm in the act of setting up um, a Bitbucket based um, uh, markdown based um, new documentation system in my system, but we're, we're using Jekyll. Um, and something that I've still not quite got my head around is the review cycle. Now, I, I understand how I've got a development background, I understand how the code review process works. But the thing that I feel a little bit concerned about, and I've not quite got a satisfactory answer, is that when you do a code review as a developer, you're reviewing the source code, and then that gets on and is built, and it's executed, and there's another test phase. Whereas if you use the ordinary Git um, review process, you're, you're reviewing the document source, not the document output. Now, if you've got heavily conditionalized content, as a lot of ours will be, because we've got multiple product variants, um, there is a need to review the source. I agree that, because you need to make sure that the writers are following the standards, that they've coded things up properly, that they've used the right markdown, that they're using the um, conditions and things correctly. But it's actually very hard to, to, however careful you are with how you set everything up, it's very hard to review the source and be sure that what the user sees at the end of the day is actually going to be the right output. So how do you allow the reviewers to, to review the source and also to, how do you sort of link it to, to built output? Or do you, or does it not matter to you in your environment? It does matter. It matters a lot, in fact, because um, Hugo is very, so I've used Jekyll and I've used Hugo. Hugo is fairly unforgiving if you make certain types of errors in the markdown file. So if you omit something in the YAML front matter, it can really kind of not work. Um, or if you have some bad markdown formatting, you get all these different things. And in your case, you've also got conditional content. So I assume you're using variables or some sort of um, to, to indicate that. So what I've seen done, um, 
are there's two kind of approaches to this. So one is full dev setup on your machine, run it locally, everything looks great. Famous last words is it worked on my machine, so that's one danger in that approach. But that is a nice way to verify that what you're writing is at least going to be buildable. Um, at one company I worked at, we we spun a, a small build or small a low resourced um, build of the docs in a staging environment for every single branch at any point in the branch's life cycle. And so you could just go to our staging server, type in the or copy paste in the branch name, and you could see that pulled in. That was really interesting because we had multiple repos. So you could also go and do a custom build and you could define which branch on which repo you wanted to see it because we had a lot of version content. And so what we did there was if you had the knowledge base articles on some version two and you had the thing that you're working on was on version three, you could build with, with mix and match. What we've done um, here, we, we have um, focused a lot on the local setup so you can build that locally. And we also have staging servers, but we have fewer of them because it's a, a much more complicated system. Um, the volume of docs is, is very different. So we actually have staging servers. We kick a build off every time you have a branch and then you can just deploy that to a staging server. Particularly because we have the integration with the other types of content. So you have to make sure that those are all working and locally that's challenging to do because you'd have to check out all those repos. Yeah, thanks. That's very much the way I'm going. That's uh, our developers have already got um, builds on virtually every branch, lots of staging environments. And my gut feeling is just to say we want exactly the same, please, exactly the way you do it. But as I say, I am very mindful of the fact that at the end of the day, they've got unit tests and um, you know, build tests and everything else. And, uh, and we haven't. So we really do need to check the output before we say, yes, this is fine. We're going to accept this content. There's a there's something that fits into there as well, which is to not do tests but to lint. Mm. Oh yes, oh yes, we're, yes. we're going to put yeah. that in as well. Yeah. Yes. yes. So we, we're going to do what we can automatically. But all I'm saying is there is a point where a human really, really, really has to read it with the best t testing that you can do somewhere well, along the line. A human's got to check it makes sense. From well, what I can tell from the talk, two people need to verify each kind of merge. Did I read that so, right, Becky? It, yeah, so in our case, we decided to make a minimum requirement to have two reviewers. And um, that has to do with the team that, that was a decision by the team, uh, the JIRA team. So you can put, put it to where there's no reviewers. Um, that was an option, but I would highly recommend having most things reviewed by at least one person. Because when you have a minor change that you wanna push out, say someone misspelled the word the, you don't really wanna put that behind a lot of barriers. You just sort of wanna send that one through. Um, so it's a bit of a balancing act. More questions? We still have a bit of time. Yeah. Um, the process starts with you writing uh, de uh, the developer writing content. Are they? Are, are you assuming the developer is going to write the content according to the style guide and in a sort of broadly public facing way or is it cleaned up by a writer before it gets reviewed? Both. So we we leave those sorts of decisions um, to the teams to make. So some teams have a lot of developers who are eager to write. Other teams have tech writers who are able to, to do the draft. Also, it depends on the type of content. So for example, API content is typically written by developers. Um, tutorial content, if you want to generalize, would be written by a uh, tech writer or it, with the help of a developer. So the that's a tif difficult question to at, uh, answer because it I've seen a lot of things happen. I've even worked at places where the product managers do a lot of writing. Um, so the, the best scenario is that somebody writes it, someone else reviews it to make sure that it's, you know, meeting grammar standards, style standards and things like that. And then somebody else tests it to ensure the code, the content works. So if you've got a procedure, does a procedure actually work? Um, so that's the gold standard. And then I think reality is somewhere kind of in between some variant of things. Okay, so I've kind of got, I've got a question around reviews, which I guess is partially an etiquette question. So I think, so we have a somewhat similar process. And one of the questions is sometimes when reviewing someone's piece of work, it might be like broadly all correct, but you might want to make a few 
you know, sometimes if you end up making dozens of little like, oh, I'd suggest phrasing it differently. I wonder about the etiquette of doing it all through code comments versus making the changes and then pushing to the same branch. I don't know what you, like if you have a preference there. I have mostly done it personally, um, mostly done it within the pull request itself. So I will comment line by line or section by section uh, instead of doing a, a full edit, unless they request a full edit up front. So that's just sort of how I've had a working relationship with my teams. Although other people will say, I don't care, just edit it for me. This is so much work. I don't want to have to read poor review comments. Um, so yeah, I think ask your team, make sure everything's okay there. But I like using the comment system because it allows you to be direct and it's not personal. I feel like what we do as well, and it's like, in general, and people seem to prefer it that way, but I sometimes feel bad when it's like, I'm literally suggesting a dozen things that I could just do very easily and I feel bad about, yeah, taking up someone else's time. But nobody is learning. Right? Yeah, that's the, yeah. You don't do that's it. true, yeah. yeah. Can I ask? Yeah, I think, sorry, I just wanna say one thing. People will, so people appreciate that more than you know, actually. I've gotten a lot of feedback from people that they, they really appreciate having someone help them write because a lot of people are insecure about writing. Sorry. Uh, um, glad you finished. Thank you. Um, so, sorry for interrupting. Um, could I ask, in terms of future plans, is it, are you sort of there and done, or is there more on your plans or roadmap for, for the next year or, ne or next 24 months as to what extra stuff you want to do? There's a ton of work to do. Um, I probably shouldn't comment on any particular roadmap things, but we do have a lot of things that we're continuing. We've only gotten a small amount of the content on the new system, so obviously we're working on it. And, you know, I believe it's a living thing. We've already rethought a little bit how the repo structure works out of necessity. So there's a lot of exciting things coming, um, but it's a long process. Like content doesn't just move by itself, unfortunately. Although that would be nice. Content elves. I think um, well, we have three minutes left, <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's 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 perfect timing. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you again. Uh, this is yeah, really thank interesting. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I look forward to seeing the other recording, but I think I've got a I've got another meeting I've got to run off to. So. Thanks a lot. Enjoy. Yeah. Thank Bye. You. Bye.